Where are these specimens from? Why were they brought here? And what motivated the people who collected them? The Grant Museum of Zoology is seeking to uncover these stories and explore natural history's links to colonialism and the British Empire through the temporary exhibition, Displays of Power. When we look at the countries that these specimens of natural history museums originate from, we can clearly map out the expanse of the British Empire. These items were collected and brought back to Britain for teaching and research purposes, but also displayed imperial power through exhibiting these exotic animals from colonised lands. In recent years, we've seen British art and anthropological museums be confronted with their colonial legacies, with discussions of repatriation. But the subject of colonialism is seldom applied to scientific institutions and collections. The Grant Museum of Zoology is one of the oldest natural history collections in the UK and home to 68,000 zoological specimens, each with interesting and hidden stories to tell. The Displays of Power exhibition uncovers these stories. It focuses on how British imperialism is intertwined with museums' collections, how the empire used science to its advantage to facilitate and justify its actions, and the role that collecting animals played in this narrative. The Microarium is a popular display at the museum which showcases walls of microscopic slides made up of microorganisms and parts of larger animals. Co-curator of Displays of Power, Hannah Cornish, wrote this label that explores how science was a tool for pushing the frontiers of the British Empire further into the tropics. So the Microarium, which is our collection of microscope slides displayed in the museum, um, the, that part of the exhibition is about the use of science to display power over nature. Part of the point of this exhibition is that stories of empire are in the museum already, so we wanted to make sure that the microarium was included. The label itself is about how um, science, medicine and microscopy are tools of empire, and it includes a quote from one of the previous curators of the Grant Museum talking about how um, tropical medicine and microscopy are going to change the world because they will allow white men to live in the tropics. The quote is from a scientist called E.A. Minchin who is a microscopist and he worked on microscopic parasites, specifically the ones that cause sleeping sickness. Um, and he was employed to go to Uganda to investigate the sleeping sickness epidemic there. Tropical medicine was very important to the British Empire and they encouraged scientists uh, to go out into the field to study things like malaria, sleeping sickness and yellow fever. There was a lot of money and prestige behind this type of research. Um, it's also worth noting that the epidemic that E.A. Minchin was investigating was probably caused by population movements that were forced by colonisation. Um, I think it's very important for all areas of science to engage with the colonial legacy. Um, empire and colonisation was woven through every part of uh, society um, in terms of um, ideology, influence and money um, and science is no different and this story from our exhibition shows that um, microbiology played a part in empire. Scientific research wasn't just seen at the very frontiers of the empire. It was vital in the advancement and maintenance of the empire as well, as demonstrated by this very unexpected creature, the shipworm. So what is a shipworm? The first thing to say is it is not a worm. The shipworm is a bivalve, so it's a creature with a shell. It's a boring bivalve, so it bores into wood. The British Empire relied on ships to carry goods and even enslaved people around the world. So the shipworm burrows into the wood, especially wood that is submerged in water. So shipworm would bury, would burrow into uh, ships and also into submerged structures like uh, the wood in ports. And this causes problems for shipping. Um, it could damage ships and it could make shipping more expensive. And what this international trade using wooden ships did was spread particular species around the world and make shipworm much more common because of course you'd have much more wood submerged in the water and you're creating a much wider environment for shipworm. So this wood that's been bored by shipworm 
was collected in Bristol, which is interesting because Bristol was a major port in the slave trade. So we don't know the context of this wood. We don't know if it came from a ship or other kind of wooden structure. But we do know that it was collected probably in the 19th century. And so there is that possibility that it actually was from a ship that had this link to the British Empire and even the slave trade. Maritime trade was the underpinning of the British Empire. We wanted to highlight that in this exhibition because natural history museums had a role in researching shipworm and other plants and animals that had an economic impact. So the work of natural history museums was helping to support the British Empire. The advancement of empire is told through the specimens in the collection. However, some specimens hide even darker stories that illustrate the devastating impacts the empire had on the indigenous peoples of the countries they invaded. Impacts that were backed and fueled by Western science. This appalling, often untold history is exposed through the story of the Tasmanian tiger in the exhibition. So this is uh, one of the specimens that we featured in the Displays of Power um, exhibition. It is of a thylacine and is an extinct marsupial. It was a carnivorous marsupial that lived in Australia um, and before then Papua New Guinea and um, Tasmania. Um, they went extinct. The last one died in Hobart Zoo in 1936. It's widely blamed that um, their extinction in Tasmania was due to excessive hunting by the colonists. When the colonists encountered thylacines or strange animals in Tasmania when they arrived, um, they also encountered Tasmanian Aboriginal people. But it's not widely known that the Tasmanian people were also hunted and treated like animals in the same way that the thylacines were. I think the British justified the genocide of the Tasmanians when they arrived in Tasmania. Um, because fundamentally they felt that Tasmanian people were subhumans. Um, the prevailing idea in Western European thought at that point, or at that time, um, anybody with darker skin must be a missing link between um, modern European man and subspecies of ape. Science playing a role, this is, you know, the embedded kind of feeling of the superiority. So again, you know, this, these ideas fed into evolutionary theories of the time. Um, and again, were used to justify each other um, that, you know, white man was number one, the top, the most evolved. The Tasmanians were definitely viewed as other, um, dangerous, exotic, something to be killed, something they feel threatened by. They were mutilated in the name of science to be dissected and put on displays in museums. So as part of this temporary exhibition display of power, we were motivated to tell this story um, because again, people may be more familiar in a natural history museum um, with animal extinction stories. Um, and again, the whole point of this exhibition was to um, shed light on unknown stories or the context of empire mm -hmm. and, you know, these darker histories um, that aren't necessarily on display in interpretation or widely known in a natural history museum or zoology museum such as this one. It's widely but wrongly believed that Aboriginal Tasmanian peoples were completely eradicated, that the British achieved their goal. In fact, many Tasmanians were displaced to missions on Flinders Island or managed to escape to islands in the Bass Strait, and their descendants can trace their lineage back to the Tasmanian people who resisted British invasions. Tens of thousands of Aboriginal people today identify as Aboriginal Tasmanian, and many are working hard to revive their languages and cultural practices that were stolen from them by the British. We want to find out the thoughts and responses of the visitors to the exhibition, and whether they think more museums should be following the Grant Museum of Zoology's lead. Uh, yes, I think it is a very important thing, and especially in the case of our Natural History Museum, because we, th we tend to think that like natural history, nature is something different from society and like more political history, um, and this exhibition really shows that this is not the case. I think one of the specimens which I really wasn't expecting which surprised me was the ship one because I really hadn't thought about how 
obviously they're really small creatures um, and they kind of tunnel into they were tunneling into the ships that were traveling for um, colonial purposes and I think just seeing how far reaching the effects of empire were on these tiny animals they had to keep trying to make sure that the ships weren't broken down basically by tiny worms I thought that was really a perfect way to illustrate how um, huge the legacy of empire was and how it was always moving across different seas and oceans. It's vital for all areas of science to tackle their lingering influence of colonialism. First by engaging with this narrative, understanding how science was used as a tool for control and oppression to further racist, sexist and political agendas, and question how the legacies left behind by this still pervade science and our society today. Science is not neutral. It's time to bring this to the forefront. These shouldn't be untold narratives. These stories should be on the front line, understood and reflected upon by both the general public and the scientific community as a whole.